to start this recording and we're ready to go. Um, I'll just give I'll do a little brief introduction while you're thinking about that one or two sentences you want to share with all of you. Um, you are on the Zoom platform and we started using this back in July. So you are able to see everybody. So uh, if you're doing a happy dance at your desk, people will see that. Um, if you're eating lunch, people will see that. If you're sleeping, people will see that. Um, so just, and if you're texting, people will see that, I guess. I don't know how they'll see that, but you can figure that out. Um, this is the first course in the six courses of the certificate program. Um, there'll be three live presentations in each of the courses. This is presentation number one. I'll go over this course and give you a feel for that. Um, you are the third cohort. So the good news is there are two other cohorts who have survived. Um, cohort one is in the third course, and they're having, I think, a great time. I taught them uh, with LEAF in the last uh, course. Um, the Zoom platform is great because it allows us to interact. You've all been on course sites. You've kind of seen the structure of that. Each session with the self-paced learning is up there. Um, this video and the PowerPoint, uh, the PowerPoint's already online for this session, session three. And the video will be online in a couple of days. You'll be able to use that video, uh, the PowerPoint, all the way through the course. So it'll be available to you to go through. Um, one of the things to remember in Zoom is if you're shuffling papers, we're all hearing you shuffle papers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just, it's that kind of, a, it's very sensitive. So you need to know that. Um, the Vibrant Faith University, or what we're now calling the Certificate in Faith Formation for the 21st Century, um, is really Vibrant Faith's work to develop a more comprehensive uh, ministry training program that really, as you'll see in this first presentation today, really will introduce us to a whole new way of thinking and doing faith formation in the 21st century. Um, so if you got a little preliminary stuff, you read a little bit of the rest, you've already got a taste of where we're going. The, the genius of the, of the certificate program is not just the courses, the reading, um, but I consider this an applied program. And what I mean by that is, We've all taken academic programs where we have um, uh, learned things and then wondered about how to apply it. This is an applied program. As you learn it, you're applying it, you're integrating it. So over the two years of the program, every course is like one sixth of the pie of the program. Um, so what you'll start working on this course, um, applying it, developing 21st century faith formation, you'll keep adding to what you do over the six courses. So um, it, it's like no one course is all by itself. And so when people say, I haven't finished everything, you're not supposed to. You have two years to be able to build that out. And the laboratory for this is your congregation. So people say, how will I know this is working? You'll look right at your congregation. Um, one of the things that we've really emphasized is, and we, you saw that in the, in the first couple of sessions that you did self-paced is, it's really important to have a back home team, people to work with who you can literally walk for, with for the next two years, uh, who will be working with you, processing it, applying it. So everything that we're presenting and providing you, you can provide your team. Um, handouts, video, PowerPoints. So we know this is kind of a team approach. One person can't design 21st century faith formation no matter how talented you are. Um, a, a big part of this is working with your team and the laboratory for it is your congregation and faith community. So um, as we go through, you'll kind of see how that will play out. Um, the key thing that, we've, that I've learned in the first two, two courses that, that I've taught is that to keep emphasizing to you, this is only course one, okay? So a lot of people want to finish it, you know, you're not. This is the first part to introduce the whole process. And then from here, this foundational course moves into the intergenerational faith formation course, the family faith formation course, the lifespan or lifelong faith formation course, the missional faith formation course, and we wrap up with leadership. So that's kind of the outline of the program. And we'll get into more of that and your questions around that. So welcome to this. We're just great to, it's glad to have you. Um, uh, the, you, you, well, we'll connect you to some of the uh, work that the first two cohorts are doing. So especially in this course, uh, later on, 
uh, they, they started building websites and networks. We'll show you kind of the work that they're doing. It's just great uh, comfort to know other people are on this journey. We can learn from each other. Even though we don't quite have a vehicle yet for all the cohorts to share, we'll be able to share their results and information with you. So uh, know that that's coming as well. So a little bit of background, uh, and I'm going to ask Lee to do a little background too, because we're the two kind of uh, co-creators, administrators, and people you can blame when things don't go right, people. Um, so um, my background is uh, I work as an adjunct for Vibrant Faith. Uh, I have for several years. Um, and my full-time work is Lifelong Faith Associates, which is me. We're looking at my office. This is the world headquarters right here uh, for Lifelong Faith Associates. And um, the, the work that I do for really my whole life has been in faith formation and different age groups uh, and especially whole congregation. This, this whole curriculum has come out of a decade plus of work that I and a number of people have done in terms of imagining faith formation for the 21st century. When you read the reimagining book, which is the text, one of the texts for this course, you'll kind of get the keynote of what this whole program is about and where we're going with it. So uh, it's great to have you with us. Leif, why don't you introduce yourself while you're here? It's good to have you. Yeah, sure. Good to, uh, good to be with you. I'm Leif Kerwald. I, I too am an adjunct at, at Vibrant Faith. I uh, have been with Vibrant Faith for five years. Uh, currently, I uh, work... Um, at least full time uh, at St. Charles Catholic Church in Northeast Portland, Oregon, where I am the parish pastoral administrator. Uh, but uh, John and I have worked closely together on the development of, of this, the Certificate in Faith Formation for the 21st Century. And uh, our pattern for development has been, uh, John is really the brains behind the coursework, uh, but I, I serve as the upload editor so the way it's presented to you on course sites uh, you can either applaud or blame me uh, and and therefore when you run into snags or questions or issues of how to navigate yourself uh, around course sites uh, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, and and I'll get back to you as quick as I can uh, about that um, the thing that I would say is uh, in, the other, in the other cohorts, several students had found it to be an advantage to have their team members, if possible, join the online live sessions that, that we're having. So they are more than welcome to either sit in the same room with you, as I see uh, in, in one of my screens here, or feel free to share the, the login link if they can join for any part of the time uh, that we're together, all the better. Uh, and you'll always have access to the recording uh, of these sessions shortly after uh, the session ends. So for example, if you go into course sites and click on week three, which is this week for you, uh, there's an item near the bottom, it's probably number five, that says uh, resources and review. That's where I will park the, uh, the recording of today's session, uh, either late today or while well, I'm traveling tomorrow, so hopefully late today, and, uh, and that'll be available to you. And typically, I also send an email out uh, to everyone when that, uh, when that video is posted. So, so that's it. Good to be with you. Good to have you in the middle of your day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's no order. Uh, I know if you're looking, if you have the, um, the kind of the gallery view, it kind of looks like for those who remember the old TV show, Hollywood squares, that's what it looks like. Everyone's in the floor, um, which is great. So if, um, I just would invite you just tell in a, in a, in a minute or so, tell us a little bit about yourself. We're going to see you three times every course. So after a while, we're going to get to know you. So, um, just share a little bit about where you are, what you're doing, um, that kind of thing. Somebody just begin. Unmute yourself so we don't see, you know, you talking and no one listening. Well, I'll start. Great. I'm uh, Joanne Rash, and I don't do riveting before noon. It's 10 o'clock here in Vancouver, Washington. Um, so I'm married, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, getting over a cold, so I may have a little cough and tickle going on. 
Um, I've got three boys, a 12 year old and eight year old twins. So that may be my riveting right there. Um, I've been with St. Andrew Lutheran Church for about eight years as a volunteer and about six months as an employee as the youth and family ministry coordinator here. So I'm excited to learn and work with all of you. That's great. Good to have you. Thank you. I'd like to go. Go across. I'm Lori Carson. Um, I'm a children, youth, and family pastor at St. Luke Lutheran Church in Ithaca, which is campus ministry of Cornell University. So there's a dynamic here that is unique. I've never worked with it before. I've been here about a year. And we are raring to go on cross-generational stuff. We're doing a lot of neat things. Cool. Got to love Ithaca. My daughter went to Ithaca College. There's no place colder in the galaxy than <laughs> Buffalo. <laughs> oh, Ithaca is even worse. Buffalo does have sun every now and then. <laughs> Who would like to go next? I will. Go ahead. I'm Jennifer Castle. I uh, work as a director of faith formation at Plymouth Church, United Church of Christ in downtown Seattle, Washington. Um, Really happy to be here. I have a daughter who's a junior in college and a son who's a senior in high school. So uh, we'll be an empty nester this time next year. So uh, this is a transitional year for me and for the church. And I'm really excited to be with you all. Great, welcome. Hello, this is Amanda Shands. I live in a little town called Erie, Illinois. And I serve as Youth and Family Ministries Director at a church uh, First Lutheran Church in Prophetstown, Illinois. Um, I have a husband. I have two daughters. One is 16 years old and the other is two. And uh, I have two dogs. And um, this is the first time I've done any kind of online learning. So I'm very excited and nervous about it. So um, hopefully I have lots of people here that can help me with that kind of thing. And Leaf and I are both here to help. So just, I'll say that to everybody, just remember to ask if you get stuck. Just let us know. And where is Erie? North, south, middle in Illinois? Um, it's northwestern Illinois, Quad Cities area. Got it. Helps at all. God's country. Yes. Lots of corn and beans right now. <laughs> Somebody else. I'm Amy Woods. I'm the Director of Faith Formation um, at Emmanuel Lutheran in Bellevue, Nebraska, which is right near Omaha. I have a son that's in eighth grade, and I have girls that are in sixth and fourth grade. Great. Yay, Omaha. Okay, I'll go next. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, I'm Pamela Ho, and... Um, I'm the interim pastor here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Loudonville, New York, near Albany. And uh, I have two children. Actually, they're not children. They're young adults. Um, recent, both of them are re recent college graduates. One is 24. The other one's 22. And they both just got jobs, so I'm very happy. Yay, Mom. <laughs> Who else would like to go? I go next. Oh. Oh, um, we're somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Cindy Kaiser, and I um, am one of the pastors at Christ Lutheran Church in Roanoke, Virginia. And I am a single mom with three boys, ages 15, 12, and 7. So, keeps me busy. A lot, of, a lot of you really don't have a life, do you? I mean, you just are, you know, parenting. I mean, like, you, to, you might actually need the three hours off rather than a course, you know, just as a break. Thanks. Yay, Roanoke. Somebody right. else? I'll go. Um, my name is uh, Heather Christian, and I'm a youth group leader at um, St. Paul's UCC in Henderson, Minnesota. It's a town of about 900 people. Um, and I have a son who's 15 and I just really have a heart for teenagers and Jesus and learning and teaching people. Great. Welcome. 
Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a pastor uh, half-time in Chatham, New York, which is just about 20 minutes west of Massachusetts. It's my first call. I'm in my third year, and I'm also a part-time Starbucks barista, which keeps me running. And um, I've, I've recently uh, joined a family. Uh, my, my partner has two children, ages 10 and almost 12. So I'm learning how to navigate that sphere. <laughs> and um, yeah, great adventures. Andrew, can you see us? Nope, I'm I'm having uh, I'm having technical difficulties with my computer here, so I did the join my phone. Okay, I see a great big swath of empty icons with names. Okay, but no um, faces. You, you certainly you'll be able to download the PowerPoint. You'll be able to watch the video again if you want. Um, but okay. I'll be using the PowerPoint. So once you, as you listen to it, you know you'll be able to to follow the PowerPoint pretty easily. Great, thank you. Who else would like to go? Who hasn't gone yet? I'll go next. Um, this is Dawn Saxton. I've lost my voice from children's ministry over the weekend. <laughs> I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, we have a children's group of about 600 kids, so lots of talking loud over the weekend. Dawn, I thought you might have gone to a concert or something like that or the Minnesota Vikings game and just lost your voice, but children's I'm ministry at work. <laughs> Good for you. Someone else. I can go. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm the associate pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Dickinson, North Dakota, which I would have to guess is pretty cold. So it gets close to some of your other locations. <laughs> I guess it does. <laughs> I'm in my second year of my first call, and uh, my call really revolves a lot around uh, faith formation and education ministries here at St. John. Great. And I'm Caitlin Olson. I'm the Faith Formation Director here at St. John. I'm actually in my first month of being here. Super excited. I help a lot with family ministry and also the youth group. Great, great. Well, this is certainly a, a baptism by fire, so to speak, you know, so it's a, kind of immerse yourself in all of this. Welcome. Thank you. Anybody not uh, introduce themselves? I'll, I'll go next. Um, I'm Norma Malfatti. I'm the director for Evangelical Mission for the Upstate New York Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So some of these New York folks, um, I am taking this course with them. It's a part of an initiative that we're doing with our synod um, to strengthen faith formation. And um, we'll meet together at some point, but we stretch about six and a half hours from one end of our synod to the other and of our participants. Um, but um, I'm really excited to, um, to be a part of this venture. We've nicknamed them Norma's people. Oh. <laughs> I like that, I do. They are my people. My people. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll go. Um, I'm Kelly Smith. I am from Wellsville, New York, um, with Shepherd of the Valley, which is a small congregation um, of about about 60 people. Um, so I wear many hats in the congregation. I am also married. My husband and I have five children, um, two in college and two that are seniors in high school and a nine-year-old daughter. The older four are boys. Um, so thankfully one last shot at a girl and it worked out. Um, I am also a teacher. I work with infants and toddlers with developmental delays and disabilities. So I have been a teacher for the past 20 years. Enjoy working with families and kids. Kelly, what's your town near? Uh, we're about two hours southeast of Buffalo. We're near basically nothing. Um, the Pennsylvania border, we're pretty rural, surrounded by farm country. The notorious southern tier. Yes, exactly. Great. Good to have you. Marv, have you been able to get sound? No. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can I unmute your audio? There we go. Marv, how about now? Unmute it. Got it. We just have no sound. Oh, golly. He can hear us, though, huh? I don't know. We had problems with it before. We'll see if we can. I, I, it's something with this computer, because I did hear him before. 
Marv, unmute. Thank you. I, I've unmuted him. One of the powers of the of the host, I guess. Is there anybody else who hasn't introduced themselves yet? Um, my name is Dale Ann. Hi. Hi. And I'm having technical difficulties. About every two minutes on the dot, everything goes blank and I have to rejoin. Then I have to join by the computer. So I keep cutting out. Do you have any idea what I should be doing to keep myself on? You know, it's, that's a first time problem because you're on twice. Now you're on once. Now you're back. About, about like I said, about every 120 seconds, my screen goes blank. It says rejoin. And so I have to keep doing this over and over and over. Dale Ann, that, that sounds to me like a, uh, a broadband issue. So if you, uh, if you're, I don't know if you're on a laptop, if you move closer to your router, or if you- oh, I'm, on my, I'm on my desktop and I'm right next to my router. Oh, oh, I see. And so you're hardwired into the router with, yes. with your desktop? I believe so. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it just, it just sounds uh, like that's a symptom of, of a broadband issue, the broadband not being quite broad enough. Uh, so I, I see that you disappeared again. Um, the only other thing that I would suggest is that you, uh, what, that perhaps you uh, log in over the phone for audio and, uh, but then s stay connected uh, video if you can with your microphone muted so you'll at least hear everything and, and see what, what's there when, when you're logged in. Okay, well, I'll go and introduce myself. My name is Dale Ann Cron, and I live in Jamestown, New York, so I'm also the Southern Tier. Um, I belong to a very small church. Um, our membership is down to about 60 now, and we are trying to, we are in an alliance. We are trying to form an, an alliance with another church and combine our congregations, and we are actually meeting together now, but we're alternating every other month between the two churches, and that has become a huge problem because people don't like alternating back and forth between the two churches, but neither church wants to give up their own building. So um, that's where our struggles are right now. Um, but we are meeting together. We have combined our Sunday schools. Our Sunday school is very small. We together with everybody. Yep, we lost her. Hmm. I'm this is totally sure. off the subject, but Joe, I actually have family members that go to your congregation. Really? Who are they? Um, the Rob family. So Jacob Rob's in your confirmation class. Nice. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Small world. This group is so diverse and yet people make connections. Um, this is, this is from Shelly Davidson. I don't, Shelly, can you hear us? I'm hoping she can. Uh, she's in, um, Bethlehem Lutheran Church. It's in the chat box. Uh, Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, she spent 22 years in the business world, and she's been with Bethlehem Lutheran for about two and a half years as the youth and family coordinator, uh, married with two daughters, 16-year-old and 11-year-old. So I'm hoping she can hear us, but I don't know. Yes, she, she does write in that, uh, uh, that she okay. can hear and see everything, just not uh, able to hear or see her. Okay. Usually Zoom is pretty good in, in adjusting itself to your bandwidth. Um, so hopefully we won't have, we won't have problems. So um, everybody get a chance to say hello. Okay, great. Um, let's just begin in a short prayer to kind of put our technology behind us and, and put God in the front of us. We take a moment in our busy day to time to learn, to interact with each other, to strengthen our ministry. And we ask God to be especially present to us. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ministries you have entrusted to us, for the opportunity to serve you and to serve our communities. We give you thanks for the opportunities to learn, to interact, to share, to grow. We ask you to send along your special grace to open our hearts and minds to you 
to the possibilities for ministry in our communities. We ask you during this course to enlighten us, give us the courage and the skills and the tools we need to do your work. And as always, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's dig in. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to share the screen where you're going to see a big PowerPoint and um, I'm going to break in and out of the PowerPoint for you to ask questions, interact, that kind of thing. So for those uh, who are listening, but if you want to put anything in the chat box, I'm watching the chat box, but you don't need to if you want to, if we're going to share in audio fashion. So what I would ask is during the PowerPoint, just mute your audio. And then when we come back for kind of a group processing, just to unmute your audio. Okay. So that way we're not, we don't have problems with background sound. Okay. I am hoping you all see that. Somebody tell me you do. Got it. Yeah, okay. got it. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is an introduction to the first course. Uh, we are in week three. Uh, if you're still kind of getting in the groove, uh, week one and two will be there when you are ready to dig into them. Um, basically, week one and two was to introduce um, the faith forming ecosystem, uh, to read a little bit about the challenges that I'll review with you today. Um, so that, you know, you'll kind of get a preview if you have not gotten into that yet, uh, which is fine. Um, and the part of the week one and two was a congregational assessment. Okay. So if you haven't completed that yet, that's something you're going to want to do as we move, um, uh, through these first couple of weeks. Uh, I think you're going to find them uh, helpful and important. Um, so today's presentation, we'll take a break, obviously, in the middle, just speak, so you can make, get up and stretch around a little bit. Um, and weeks four through eight are, um, let me just get this up for a minute. Um, weeks four through eight are, um, the self-paced sessions. So what I introduced in my presentation one, you'll go deeper in, in week four, five, six, seven, and eight, and that'll kind of round out the uh, looking at the uh, ecosystem. I'm sorry. And then in week nine, will be live presentation two, and that's scheduled for November 1st. Um, and we'll introduce the second half of the course in which week, one, week 10, 11, 12, 13 will all be follow-ups to that. Um, week 14, is a, we moved that a little bit earlier because we wanted to get it in before Christmas and not do it the week before Christmas. So live presentation three is on December 14th, and that'll be a combination of a little presentation from me <coughs> and presentations from the projects you are working on, kind of a status report update um, I know it says there, develop a faith formation website. Do not panic. Um, in week number nine, I'll introduce that and how we begin working on that. In week 11, it says build a network. Again, don't panic. That's the first step in the process. So uh, we want to introduce a network approach to learning and start building that kind of a network approach. And then week 15, the last thing you'll be thinking about is Vibrant Faith University and the certificate program, but there'll be some guided reading around curating resources in faith formation. So that's, in a nutshell, that's the course. Um, the self-paced sessions, I think you'll find them helpful as you work with your team to kind of go deeper. And basically in both live presentations, one and two, I'll introduce the content that's coming. So you'll kind of get an introduction to that. These are the two books. Uh, on the left, John Stewart's book is a good theological grounding um, in a congregation that's engaged in what, what we would call faith, you know, lifelong faith formation, faith formation with all ages and generations. Um, I think you'll find it very read readable and very pastoral. On the right is my book, which is basically the keynote for this whole program. So um, I think once you dig into that, you'll get, kind of get more theology and then more theory practice about this approach. And basically in the weeks 
uh, of the self-paced session from now to the next live presentation, you'll walk through the Envisioning the Congregation book, as well as a couple of chapters from the Reimagining book. Online, and I'll share with you some resources as we move through the, through the day, through the afternoon. Um, I built the Reimagine Faith Formation website to, to kind of work in sync with the whole program. You'll find more in-depth materials, handouts, articles, all that kind of good stuff on reimagining faith formation. And that's something that I've produced. It's all free, everything that's there. Um, hopefully you'll keep going back to that as a, a online source resource center for you as you think in, about faith formation, as well as as you develop faith formation with each of those uh, age groups. What I want to do is just give you a, a little bit of a sense of like what's going on here with uh, our changing world. Now, you'll read about this in the first chapter in the Reimagining book, and I know that you're familiar with these. So this is more of a kind of a summary highlight of four perspectives on our changing world. Um, I could uh, have easily done 40 perspectives, and you would have all needed therapy tomorrow. Um, these four are especially relevant to us in faith formation. So that's why I highlight these. Um, so I'm going to do these, and then I want to take some time to, for us to process that, and this will be the first part of, of, our, of our course. So let's dig into the social, some of the social cultural things. I really become fond of this quote. It's actually a quote from Pope Francis, but it's, it's one that just seem, seems to capture where we are. And he, he said, this is about a year ago, he said, not, we're not just living in an era of change, but we're living in a change of eras. And I think that really encapsulates why we're seeing so much change and the acceleration of change. It's not that, that this is simply an era in which change is the norm, but we're changing from one era to the next. You might be familiar with Phyllis Tickle's The Great Emergence, in which she looks at these big 500-year uh, epics um, and she talked about as we enter the new millennium, 2000, that we enter the new era. And so this change of eras brings with it all kinds of uh, challenges for us, especially in church. So four big adaptive challenges. The first one has to do with just increasing diversity in society. And I'll unpack all of these. Lifespan, generations, family structures, ethnic makeup. Um, it's a it's just a dramatically different world than 50 years ago. Let's, we'll contrast it that way. Second one, the dramatic changes and diversity in religious beliefs, practices, and affiliation. I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, just this week, there's been more research about these changes that look more permanent. They don't look just like a trend. They look like they're kind of baked in. These are the things that are, that are now true about what's happening. The decline in religious transmission from generation to generation uh, this is something that people aren't writing and talking enough about in my estimation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the rise of the new digital technologies that simply are reshaping society. Um, so as I do this, I'm gonna do this kind of on a national perspective, but what I'd love you to reflect on is not so much what's going on across the United States, you know, North America, Europe, but to really think more about how did these big challenges affect my congregation and my community. Because uh, they have to come home to, this is what our community is going through. How am I gonna respond through, through the work of faith formation with all ages and generations? So um, think less about these big trends, think more about how these big trends impact my local setting. So lifespan diversity. We are now a 10 decade society. Um, I have a good friend who does intergenerational faith formation, Linda Stotts, and uh, a couple of weeks back we were talking on the phone, she said, I just finished a program on Sunday that the church asked me to come in and do an intergenerational uh, program for them. Um, they said it'd be about 40 or 50 people, and, I, and she said, I, you know, I really didn't want it. It was a Sunday, I really didn't want to go, but I went. And she said, we had 10 decades present and accounted for. She said, I had somebody as young as three and four years old, and I had somebody who was 103 years old. And she said, it, it just brought home to me not only the richness of our decades and generations, but that we really are a 10-decade society. And so I think about that lifespan diversity, 
And I always ask myself, how well are churches positioned to be a 10-decade church? Um, certainly, we've, our strong suits have been, you know, roughly five or six years old to 15 or 16 years old, that, those 10 years, that decade, if you will. But how well are we positioned to be a 10-decade church? Which means how well are we positioned to do lifelong faith formation from zero to 103? Um, that takes a whole different mindset and a whole different approach. Um, and really, most of life is after 15 or 16. I mean, adult faith formation is just huge and is not usually the strong suit in most congregations. Five, generational diversity. Um, every generation has its unique generational identity. And these are looser constructs than developmental understandings or life stages. But when you look at these, um, what you see pretty closely is that not only the five generations have their own historical cultural identity, but they also have unique relationship to institutions and authority, unique approach to family relationships, uh, work-life balance, communication, technology, the way they learn, the way they express their spirituality, the way they worship. Um, so it's really, it's really pretty unique that we, we, we now have five generations. And in many of our extended families, we have all five generations. Uh, as people live longer, we have more of these generations. And so in what way do we develop a generational perspective on faith formation? Um, in what way do we address the unique generational styles of each of these five generations? Um, we'll talk a lot more about that in the second course when we look at intergenerational faith formation because we do a whole piece on generational profiles and diversity. Third piece is family diversity. Um, it wasn't so long ago, you know, that we thought in my popular stereotype that really the family was mom, dad, and the two kids. And in fact, it never has been that, but that was the stereotype, the idyllic family, so to speak, which was really the TV family. These are 11, at least 11 examples of a kindred family, let alone non-kindred family relationships. So when we think about families in our communities, we need to be thinking about family this broadly. And while it was true 15 or 20 years ago, people didn't use family to describe these. In fact, Americans do use family to describe all these different arrangements. Um, just especially, for example, grandparents as primary or secondary caregivers, one out of every six households uh, is intergenerational and grandparents playing a role as primary or secondary caregivers. So this is a dramatic change. Um, so when we're thinking about family, it's much more nuanced, it's much more diverse, it's much more expanded. Um, so on both age, age lifespan and generation and family, what we're seeing is expansion, uh, more inclusivity uh, in terms of understanding and then religious diversity. Uh, probably the, the biggest headline is over the last 20 years, um, the spiritual religious identities have become much more diverse. So it wasn't so long ago that pretty much everybody was in that green color. Vibrant faith, active engagements, these were the actives. Um, most people found, if you were going back to the 50s or earlier, most people found the church as really the center of their life and the center of the community. And that's changed dramatically. So now we can talk about these, at least these four different religious profiles, the vibrant faith and active engagement folks. We know that that's a smaller number in many congregations. People with minimal engagement with the faith and, the, and community, I call them occasionals. Um, and a lot of these are parents who bring their children to Sunday school or bring their children for big ritual milestone sacramental moments. And then we only see them occasionally but at least we see them occasionally. They have occasional contact with us, um, at least in the years when their children and teenagers are engaged in church. Um, and you've seen a big difference in the, in the green and the gold in the sense that regular church attendance now is usually two or more times a month as opposed to weekly. Um, so there's a whole transformation going on there. And then the real growth area uh, is the spiritual but not religious, those who have moved outside of established religious traditions, outside of established religious communities, um, but are still living spiritual, in many ways, Christian lives, but without a faith community, 
or with a new faith community or support group or small community. Um, so spirituality, yes. Religious engagement with an established church, no. And this is a growing area. I'll show you a little bit of research on how we've even got a better picture of who these people are. And then the not religiously affiliated. People in many ways who have simply given up on established religion. Um, there was just an interesting study in the last couple of weeks on, on you know, why are we losing 20 and 30 somethings? And one of the most uh, uh, popular answers, most of the top three or four answers was that people don't feel a need for religion and therefore they don't feel a need for religious communities. Um, so it, we now have this very diverse picture, very challenging. Um, when I started in faith formation and ministry 46 years ago, we had none of this kind of diversity, uh, whether it was age group, generational, family, or now religious diversity. So the challenges are, are just immense. Um, this fills in some of the texture. So between 07 and 14, the Christian share of the population fell from 78.4 to 70.6. It doesn't sound like a lot, except we're talking about 330 million people that it's a percentage of. Um, driven mainly by declines among mainline Protestants and Catholics. Um, Catholics, yeah, well, you'll see that in a minute. Uh, the unaffiliated experience the most growth, and the share of Americans who belong to non-Christian faiths also increased. So the growth of Eastern religions. Um, so you see the numbers. The red is obviously decline. Um, the one rise is in the number of affiliated. From This is a very short amount of time sociologically. It's only seven years. From 16.1 to 22.8. So that's pretty dramatic stuff. Um, Catholics down 3.1%. Uh, even evangelicals down a percentage point. So not only have they kind of plateaued, but there's also a decline. Mainline's down 3.4. So Catholic and mainline, that accounts for the most dramatic uh, decline. Um, Non-Christian faiths up a little bit. But it's very generational. Okay, so it's not like we're losing a lot of the builder or silent generation. And so we have a small change there, plus two. Uh, not not statistically significant by any means. Boomers, a little bit. This counteracts the belief that boomers will come back to religion all by themselves on their own, because that, that we don't see that happening at all at this point in terms of, of the data. Generation X, a slight uptick, and that's probably more with the younger generation Xers who are in their later 30s, early 40s, than the older ones who are now mid-50s. Amazing. And then the older millennials, you see a 9% uptick from 25 to 34, only in seven years. So that's a huge number of people. And then the younger millennials, they started, they don't, they don't do any survey data until people are 18 years old. So between 90, the was born between 90 and 96, we're already starting at 36%. So a huge challenge in terms of reaching the spiritual but not religious or the unaffiliated. Pew Research has done the, the, the bulk of the research around this. And so they really talked about how the U.S. public became less religious. And this looks like a long-term trend. Um, and this is a huge challenge for us as religious organizations and communities. So as of 2014, the religiously affiliated are by and large about as religious as they were in 07. So those who were affiliated continue to, to be religious in terms of pray, read the Bible, say religion's important, attend services at least monthly. Okay, so that's remained relatively consistent among the religiously affiliated. But the percentage of adults who describe themselves as religiously affiliated has gone down. So in that very short amount of time, 07 to 14, it's gone from 83% of adults to 77. So if you're looking at your community saying, we seem to be losing people, um, this is the trend that you're, that you're seeing, okay? You're probably not losing people in my generation, the older boomers or the builders, but it's probably Xers and millennials. And of course, we don't know yet what about the I generation who are now 16, almost 17 years old, uh, what their profile will be. But if the trend line appears the same, we're going to see very similar numbers in, that mimic the millennials. So at the same time, the percentage of adults who are religious unaffiliated has jumped about seven points. So percentage who describe themselves as affiliated gone down. The number who are now religiously unaffiliated gone up. 
So you see, it's a, it's a causal thing. And the nuns have become even more secular so uh, in their beliefs and practices. So you'll see again, there's a, there's a decline in um, many of the nuns at spiritual but not religious and unaffiliated uh, believe in God, pray daily, um, even attend services. You know, they may shop around, but even that number has gone down. Um, and then you see the net overall result is that an overall U.S. population has become slightly less religious, and it's across 300-something million people, um, but it's particularly generational. And so that's why this chart is really important to us, why we're seeing such a decrease in the number of younger, meaning 40 and under, uh, in our congregations. It's not just demographics that there are, they're not out there. It's really that they have, have they left us behind. These patterns, as you see here, this is the National Study on Youth Religion data. These patterns actually start pretty early. So a faith of their own is the high school kids analysis, and then souls and tradition was the young and emerging adults, 18 to 23, 24. Um, but already you see the number, for example, of atheists up on top and avoiders, that 29% would basically be called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. But down below, it's, it's religiously indifferent, disconnected, and right there you have 40%. So you see the jump in the number who are really want nothing to do with religion. Um, and of course, co you know, concomitantly, you have the, from abiders to tr committed traditionalists, you have a decline in the most faithful ones. So it starts early. When Christian Smith says people make their decision about God by 14, or they don't, no, don't take that as they never could. Uh, it does tell you that people make the decision about God and about their religious tradition relatively early in life. <clears throat> We've now got research on the spiritual but not religious. <coughs> and Linda Mercadante has done a wonderful book, and Elizabeth Dresser has just done another book called Choosing Your Religion. Um, and both of those are just really good studies of in-depth interviews with spiritual but not religious types. What Linda Mercadante identifies are people across this continuum, from the dissenters through casuals, explorers, I like that, spiritual tourists, um, seekers, and then immigrants. So it's a much more nuanced pattern that people have simply left organized religion or established churches and are now free agents. Um, they all leave a little differently or they all have a little different approach. Um, so you, in the dissenters, you see people who have pretty much either protested or drifted away. Um, the casuals uh, actually practice. Um, it's more... Uh, I would call instrumental. Explorers are people uh, who are out there, you know, experiencing or sampling different religious traditions. Seekers are looking for a home. So when we talk about outreach or uh, missional efforts, this is a group that is, it would be a prime target. And the immigrants have moved to a new land, either they changed churches or moved from Eastern to Western, Western, Eastern, whatever. Um, and they're trying to adjust to this new identity and community. So it's a pretty nuanced picture. There's no one type of spiritual but not religious person. This was an interesting a little piece of a national study done on Catholic families. So these were all families, these are all parents who identified themselves as Catholics, um, and they had children or teenagers. So that was the sample. So it was pretty much a self it was a self-selected group. They asked them this question. Now, these, these are the people who identify as Catholics, you know, and, and want to be Catholic. Do any of your children currently attend a Catholic elementary middle school? 8%. A Catholic high school? 3%. A parish-based Catholic religious ed program? 21%. A youth ministry program? 5%. None of the above. And this is among people who self-identify as Catholics? 68%. So two-thirds, their children or teens are not involved in any type of faith formation at church. Um, really interesting. 
It just shows the impact of all the trends we've just looked at. Another piece of research on this, and I'm spending a little more time on the uh, spiritual religious diversities for this reason, because it's so much of what we're engaged in. So this is research by Josh Packard on what he calls de-churched U.S. adults, and he calls them church refugees. These are the duns. He said about 60, what, 65 million or so have left uh, the church, churches, Christian church. Um, about 30.5 million, though, left the church but kept their faith, and about roughly half left the church with no faith affiliation whatsoever. So, again, it's, it's another nuance to say this picture is much more complex than headlines would allow us to believe. By gender, it's about half and half. I would have guessed this would have been more male than female new. In my own Catholic world, and lifelong Catholic, and worked in the Catholic Church for decades, if you lose the women, it's all over. I mean, that's, I mean, they're in all the leadership roles in terms of church life, ministries, and the rest. So it's, in, in the Catholic world, that, that, that's, not a good, that's not good news. Uh, but I think that's true across the board. The, the highest age group are 35 to 54. So you have very, pretty much the Gen X crowd and the very you know, youngest boomers. And the second one would be um, millennials followed by um, boomers. Look how involved they were. I mean, so 44% just attended church services. So they kind of, if you will, they kind of drifted away from church. But some were involved in, in services and events or small groups, volunteered their time, involved as a leader. So 17% attended plus something else. A third volunteered their time to serve in the church. I mean, we're losing people who volunteered. We're in leadership in some way. And then 3% were heavily involved, and God forbid, 1.1% 1 .1 was on paid staff, and they're done with church. That's not good news for paid staff. This is fascinating. And I don't know if this would have been true 20 years ago or 10 years ago, but since leaving organized religion, have been able to find other outlets, small groups, online, whatever, for spiritual growth? Yes. 71% yes, or almost 72%. And how important is religion? Again, look at 40% very important, another 40 some percent somewhat important. So the vast majority of religion is important, but they're done with church, but not God or faith. I find that an interesting group of people. And then duns and the frequency of prayer. These people who pray daily, a half over half, another quarter weekly or monthly. So I mean, these are the people you want in adult faith formation. These are the people you want in leadership roles, and, but they're done with church. And what is the likelihood you'll ever become involved in again? Almost two-thirds say not likely. They didn't say no, but they said not likely. And only about 28% said somewhat likely. Some of their reasons, I highlighted a couple that I thought were, you know, really self-inflicted. Church too judgmental, too bureaucratic, and the and preaching. You've heard those before. But number four, church is not where I encounter God. Oh my goodness. Church is not where I find community. I couldn't find a church that was welcoming. I mean, golly, if you can't be welcoming, I mean, even if you don't do all the things right, this is like church 101. Welcome people, make them feel you know, hospitality, make them feel part of the community and accepted. And number eight was really interesting. I wanted to be more involved in living out God's calling in my life. And they don't say it, but, and I didn't get any help from my church to do that. Um, I highlight those four because I just think those are right in the sweet spot of what we try to do in faith formation. My analysis is simple. The younger generations are more unaffiliated, and, and, and that trend is continuing and less involved. The older generations are more affiliated and more involved. So we don't complain that you've got older people at church. It, we'll see in a moment how do we actually work with the folks that we have because every one of those boomers and builders, grandparents, are connected to a whole family system, and they can be powerful faith formers of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. As younger generations replace the older generations, they'll be fewer engaged and more unaffiliated. That's, that's the, that's what we're talking about that timeline of the next 20 years or less. 40% of the no religion in particular say religions vary or somewhat important. We saw that. So that's good news. Um, the overwhelming majority of religiously unaffiliated believe in God. 
People leaving is less about people losing their religion than dissatisfaction with available institutional options. I often think if you're in many, many churches, if you're not become an empty nest parent, adult, with kids that have moved out finally and they're on their own, um, what does church have to offer you? You know, and you could be 50 years old. You could be 55 or 60. What does church have to offer you? I think we drop the ball on people who have been engaged with us, uh, and that may be part of that available institutional options for that generation. The younger generation seem allergic to large-scale institutions that demand not only spiritual allegiance but financial commitment. None of these things are religion for these people. Let me go to this one. Richard Flurry, uh, some of his insights uh, I just shared, um, had this wonderful quote that I thought was really important. He said, religion's not going away anytime soon, regardless of how people may identify themselves, but business as usual among existing religious institutions will not stem the losses we are seeing. And I think that kind of summarizes, you know, my sense and my feeling about this data. Let, with two more pieces and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, well, let's stop there for a moment. And I'll, and I'll come back to this. So let me stop, stop, sharing my, stop sharing the screen and take a step back. You see in all these diversities of generation, age group, uh, uh, family, and now religious and spiritual questions, thoughts, uh, hopefully you're all on the first floor of your building so you won't jump out the window. Um, what are you thinking? Just turn on your audio and share something. One thing that kind of stood out for me was, you know, we think of the Duns and we think they're done. They don't have any, any faith life after they've left the church, but that's not necessarily true. And we need to try to remember that, to find ways to engage them in lives of faith outside of the church walls. Yeah, it, it, there's an interesting thing. I'm not sure we know how to do this yet, but... What happens when you move the, uh, the focus from the church kind of building campus to the world and you start thinking about faith formation in the places people actually live their lives? Um, because we know faith formation is portable today in ways that it wasn't 10 or 20 years ago. Um, it's in, it, yeah, it's interesting. The Duns, I, I think the most important thing about that research was that it, it, it's just so clear um, you can influence the duns. The nuns might be harder, especially the ones who are really unaffiliated. That might be, you know, that might be a harder task. But the duns have a reservoir of memory and experience that how to connect might be the, the key. Yeah. And as always, God's not the problem. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, it's not God that's the problem. It's us. What are you thinking? Questions, thoughts? So I continue to be fascinated by um, the church's relationship with single people and, um, and younger. So I'm a single person and 40. And um, if I weren't a pastor and had a job at church, um, it's the most, uh, it's the loneliest hour, hour and a half of life. Um, have talked with other single people who are engaged in worship. And, um, and just thinking about ways. And I noticed when you were doing the family, the different family categories, there was nothing there about single people um, and the ways in which, right? That's part of, I think, the, um, the ways in which people have left the church. And not that the church should, um, right? There doesn't necessarily need to be a singles ministry, but a different way of, um, of addressing um, people who are waiting longer for marriage. And um, in those situations, yeah. It would have been, I don't have any data on it, but it would have been really fascinating to do mm -hmm. a slide on non-kindred families, which is just populated with single people finding other people, different living arrangements, that kind of thing. Um, there's, there's not a lot of data on that because it's really hard to track it, but, th but that normal would be very, very true, that single people are connecting with others, whether it's with marrieds or less, or with, other singles in some really new family forms um, 
that are non-kindred families. And, you know, we're just, we're not connecting with that. Other thoughts? You have glazed overlooks. Don't have glazed overlooks. I think it's really helpful um, in terms of, a, one of our challenges is, you know, our membership has declined like everybody else's membership has declined and the default is, well, let's just go do the things that we did 20 years ago and the masses will flood back in the door. So, I mean, one of my rules around here is, you know, and I think people are tired of me saying this, but we're not unique. We're, we're all in this together, folks, and the, you know, the writing's on the wall. And um, so, you know, while this can be kind of depressing, it's also, I think, enormously comforting in, in that we are all in this together and figuring it all out and that things really need to change. Um, yeah, but it's sometimes a hard sell. I mean, I think folks in our churches really think if we just bring that program back or we have the mayor of Seattle come speak again, there'll be, you know, 500 people here. And it's just the, the civic church that we used to be doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it's, I, I think the conclusion by most sociologists is that they're not going to, people aren't going to come back on their own. They're just, it's not going to be a natural process. Some of us have been around for the block a couple of times. And there was the old theory that over time, you know, people would be away for a few years, you know, but there was this U-turn effect that eventually they would come back home when they got married and all those kinds of things. Wow. Well, the dilemma is um, if they're away for 10 or 15 years and so many things intervening happened that the, any relationship or connection simply lost. So. Now, it would be nice to, to be able to retrieve some of those old things to bring people back, but which is actually, in one sense, once you acknowledge the fact they're not coming back naturally, the question is, well, how do we build a church that goes out and reaches them and connects with them? I mean, so like the impetus is there. That's why I like Flory's statement, business as usual is not going to take you into the future. And certainly business as yesterday is even worse. <laughs> so... Yeah, I want to hold on to what Norma was saying uh, and what you're con commenting on here, John, is that if the church doesn't have anything to say to people for 10 to 15 years uh, in the time in which they're not part of a, a typical historical American family, uh, then when they do become part of a family, they'll have this uh, cultural uh, feeling that this church d doesn't really mean anything for me anymore. Uh, I, I, think, I think that this rising group of especially millennials uh, who are waiting longer and longer to get married, we need to figure out how to reimagine and translate some of the symbols of our faith for their lives, yeah. um, which might mean that we might have to talk about things that have historically made our churches really uncomfortable, um, talking about sexuality and uh, talking about uh, where we find meaning outside of just our vocation as family members and maybe even outside of our vocation as employees, um, but really reimagining what that might mean for people. Church is more comfortable going from religion, faith to life, than from life to faith. And we have to get really comfortable going from life to faith. Um, and I think with that decade especially, yeah, they're just, we, we've lost relationship. And when you lose a relationship, it's really hard to do it programmatically or with gimmicks. You have to have a relationship to make the whole thing work. Okay, let's do just two more pieces and then we'll take our, our take a stretch. Um, and this will finish the, the uh, analysis piece. So pop back up. Everybody see that okay? Just one person tell me. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Don't be afraid to, to jump in, it's all right. Um, okay. This is research, you'll see this quoted in a number of the books, and I quote a little bit of this in the, in the uh, reimagining book. Um, this, is, this is from, um, Vern Bankston's Families and Faith book. 
Bankston did this research over 40 years with the same people. It's just unprecedented. Um, he started with a group, religious, and it was, it was multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious, um, and he stayed with those same families over those generations for 40 years. And what he was looking for was transmission, which is how do families transmit a religious tradition or not? So families are always transmitting. You can transmit a tradition or not, but you're always transmitting. So if you take, the, if you take this diagram from left to right, the closer you get to youth religious practices and beliefs, the stronger the connection. In other words, it's not causal, but the stronger the connection towards the outcome. So we see on the far left, and things that, you know, culture, historical events, generational differences, peers, they have an influence, but it's the most removed. And then church and synagogue and temple and, and the leaders, priests, ministers, youth ministers, uh, the influence of a, of a religious school or college, those things have an impact. But again, it's kind of, it's second in, but the more important ones are now coming. And all the next four are all family are all family. So the family's religious inheritance, it's not as important as parents' role modeling, but it's important. The tradition the child's born into, the parents' involvement in church, that really the only thing that makes a significant difference in a child or teenager participating in church is that moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas participate in church. And then if it's the same faith, obviously transmission is enhanced, a mixed faith, his research, the transmission is dramatically reduced. Grandparents make a huge difference. Supporting the religious agenda of mom and dad, being role models for grandchildren, or in some places, being the, the surrogate, so to speak. In other words, that they take, grandparents take over the religious role in terms of tr transmission with their grandchildren, because mom and or dad uh, are not able to do that. So grandparents, huge in the study. And I think that's, that's, that's good news for us because we do have that generation involved in church, at least for the moment. Parents role modeling. Um, again, their involvement in church or synagogue, home prayer and instruction. Uh, two big things, praying and reading the Bible seem to have a huge impact. Uh, and their own consistency, word and deed. And then the quality of the relationship between the parent and the child. So this is both parenting style and relationship. So a warm relationship, a close relationship versus a distant one. Um, author uh, authoritative as opposed to authoritarian parenting style. The authoritarian and distant certainly had, had negative uh, implications for transmission. Per uh, family harmony as opposed to conflict promoted transmission, and the openness of parents to religious choice, allowing their children, especially teenagers and young adults, to experience a, a variety of different religious tra traditions and, and being willing to engage around that. So they found that that openness or tolerance was actually a positive, not a negative in terms of transmission. It provided all kinds of opportunities for discussion and, and engagement with their own tradition. So. Of these factors, family, grandparents, parents, relationship, and parenting style, big, big difference in transmission. So what we, can what we can discern from the research are these nine, and we're going to talk a lot about this in the, in the family course especially, is that the more these things happen, the more they make a difference in terms of faith transmission parents' personal faith and practice, the parent-child relationship, modeling and teaching. So this is, the sociologists would call this modeling and teaching socialization, you know, that they're socializing their children. Um, parents' involvement in church life, the grandparents' religious influence and relationship, the tradition a child's born into. Obviously, um, if, if, if the tradition uh, is, is central to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, and if the parents are the same faith, you put them on a trajectory towards, uh, towards a faith practice. Family conversations, willingness to talk about faith as part of the flow of everyday life. 
and then what this category called embedded family religious practices. Living family life and incorporating praying, reading the Bible, celebrating rituals, and a whole lot more into the everyday flow of family life. Um, that it's just that you basically are immersed into this environment of, of religious practice. And as a child or a teenager, you, you catch it, you experience it, you're immersed in it. Uh, and so these nine things make a huge difference. We've got tons of research talking about how important these nine things are. So what we need to know about transmission is it's a family affair. Now, in light of everything we just looked at, we can see why there's less religious transmission because of all the changes going on. And that most parents are older millennials and younger, well, millennials, but, and, and, and boomer, and uh, Xers rather. So um, families can transmit a particular religious faith or not. So you can actually transmit non-affiliation. What we're seeing is declining levels of family religious transmission and faith practice at home as a result of non-affiliation. So increasingly, you probably are seeing um, first generation who have disaffiliated, left church, or occasional in church, who are now raising children, the second generation, who are not affiliated. So um, I think you see this really clearly at Vacation Bible School if your church does that, because usually Vacation Bible School, because you open it up to the community, is here comes everybody, which means it's kind of a laboratory for um, this whole religious diversity piece. You know, so you have this whole spectrum. And so you have a lot of children who are engaged. They go to Sunday worship, Sunday school. So Vacation Bible School is an extension. You'll have some for which Vacation Bible School is their only religious spiritual experience all year long. Um, and so you'll see it when you introduce a Bible story of those who know the Bible story already and those who don't know what the Bible is. You know, so you're going to see this diversity played out in a lot of your, what I'll call more community-wide programming. If this pattern continues, we can expect higher levels of non-affiliation and lower levels of church involvement in younger families. So last, the changes that are happening with technology. We'll just do a little, I'll do a little touch of, of this because we're all familiar with, we now live in a digital culture. This is a revolution in which people have all the gadgets already. So from a church perspective, you don't have to buy anything. People already have all the gizmos. And the, and the gadgets connected to the digital media and tools is, is, is spawned a revolution. And notice all of these things are portable. And they, regardless of age, you know, so the, 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 the saturation's already happened in the under 50 crowd. So the next, you know, the next big push is going to be in the over 70 crowd. And increasingly, you're finding that everybody is connected in some way, shape, or form, whether it's laptop, tablet, phone. Um, my 96-year-old mother-in-law is in a nursing home, which has some of the best broadband I've ever seen uh, in a nursing home, you know, where the average age is probably, you know, 85 years or 90 years old. Um, because they, not only does she have a Kindle so she can listen to books and also read books, um, but because so people can come and share with them uh, photos on Facebook and Flickr and videos and all the rest and, and share that with her. The nursing home is better equipped for learning and faith formation than many churches are. Lee Rainey is at the Pew Internet and American Life Center and Barry Wellman's at the University of Toronto Net lab. And they've been studying this revolution, oh golly, for 20 plus years. And what they talk about is the triple revolution. The internet revolution, 25 plus years old now. The mobile revolution, less than 10. And the social media revolution, less than 10. That these three have all converged. So obviously the internet had to precede all of it. But the rise of, of mobile and the rise of social media, which is now increasingly, if not overwhelmingly, accessed mobily. I think the number is something like two-thirds to three-quarters of everybody who connects to Facebook does it from a mobile device. Um, so what's happened is information, you could say society, is now portable, personal, and participatory. 
I think this is huge because you take the word information out and put faith formation in, and you begin to wonder how is faith formation now portable, personal, and participatory. So I think that's a huge, it's a huge societal shift, and education has benefited tremendously from this shift. What they say is the social network, internet, and mobile revolutions are coming together to shift people's social lives away from densely knit family, neighborhood, and group relationships toward more far-flung, less tight, more diverse personal networks. So the world I grew up in, in the 50s and early 60s, was densely knit. You know, my neighborhood, everybody knew everybody in my neighborhood. And if you were to ask me, even though I wouldn't know what you were talking about, how big was my social network? I would have said it was four blocks to the school, elementary school I went to, and the playground, and six blocks to the, to the city park where we played baseball and the rest, and then everybody in between. That was the neighborhood. But lives were densely knit so that people's, people's lives were intertwined, and sometimes they just knew too much about each other. But that neighborhood um, was, was, was really a community of people who shared a common bond. Today, we think less about that. And by the way, churches in those days were communities where everybody knew everybody else and shared, a, in many cases, a common ethnicity, as well as a common faith and a common neighborhood and a lot of intertwined family relationships. Today, we really think about community or networks really as community, much more far flung, less tight, more diverse. And, and it's so hard to, to be able to, to communicate to churches that they really are less communities and they're more networks of people um, who are, are, are not as tightly connected. Now, in smaller communities, more connected. In ethnically you know, uh, vibrant communities, more connected. But in general, uh, I work with some churches, especially these big Roman Catholic parishes, non-denominationals that are five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand people. Um, they're really just an assembly of communities, and if they're younger, they really are an assembly of personal networks. Um, it's changed dramatically. What Rainey and Wellman say is that these three revolutions, mobile, internet, um, and social media, um, have made possible a new operating system, the way we think about our lives socially. And they call it networked individualism. The hallmark of networked individualism is that people function more as connected individuals and less as embedded group members. And we really know that, it's, that that's true. So everybody is connected, but we tend to be less embedded. And, and so um, that's a huge shift in the nature of community as a society but it's also less embedded as churches. So if you take, take this back 50 years, there was such a rich parish or community church life that people uh, were connected um, through all kinds of experiences. Um, so it was not only Sunday worship, it was festivals and ethnic traditions and family programs and sports leagues and the rest. So community really, I mean, the, the church really was uh, an embedded um, group member model. I mean, it's really, it, it's really what it was. In fact, we still use the word people are members of our community. That, that holds, it's a holdover. Um, but today, people don't think about life that way. They really think about life as, as connected to groups of people for which they have a relationship, some close in and some more distant. What Wellman and, and, and uh, Rainey say is that networked individualism stands in contrast to the longstanding social arrangements that have performed around large hierarchical bureaucracies and small, densely knit neighbor groups such as households, communities, and work groups. So that's, that's the way life used to be organized. But now, with this new model, it, networked individualism, um, it's, it's now the way people connect, communicate, and exchange information. So if you want to think about this model, just think about the way Facebook is developed. Facebook is a networked individualism dream because you, you, you are the center of a network of relationships. You have a variety of groups. Many of those groups get particular information from you. 
and not others. You share photos with some and not others. Um, it, it's a very interesting way. Facebook is a, is a great example of networked individualism. You're connected, but you're not embedded. Um, and it's more far flung. So how do we pull it all together? Well, John Cotter in his book, Accelerate, um, has this great quote. He says, the world is now changing at a rate at which the basic system structures and cultures built over the past century cannot keep up with demands being placed on them. I just think that's a perfect line. Take out, you know, uh, you know uh, organizations and just put church in there. The church is now, the world is changing in a way in which the church can't keep pace. Incremental adjustments to how you manage and strategize, no matter how clever, are not up to the job. You need something very new to stay ahead in an age of tumultuous change and growing uncertainty. But for me, that's just perfect. So this is the challenge you face. So, so much effort in, in church life, church work, faith formation, um, has really gone to the technical side, trying to apply our knowledge, skills, and tools that we already have to these huge challenges and kind of coming up short. We're in the midst of these huge adaptive changes that can only be solved through experimentation, innovation, adjustments everywhere in the organization and require a change of heart and mind. I think our big two adaptive responses, you'll see this in the book, but you'll also see it with, uh, together uh, in the next part, is we need to create a new way of forming faith. We need to create a new way to do faith formation. So I'll pause there. All right, just take a, take a deep breath. Um, that's the big adaptive challenges. And I think that last slide of technical and adaptive really poses the question um, that we're going to address over, the, over these next two years. How do we develop transformative, adaptive solutions to these big issues that get played out right in our community? with our families, with our young adults, with our adults, they get played out every day in where we live. Questions about the big challenges that we face, thoughts, concerns. Don't let me do all the talking because that would not be hard as you could probably guess by now. I think that, um, you know, I would agree with Pretty much everything that has been discussed. I mean, it, these whether you're in the big church or a small church, um, you feel those issues. And I, I do. I, I couldn't put it into words, but you did it wonderfully. Connected but not embedded. And and I'm feeling that um, in our location more and more um, that people they want to be connected to the church, but they aren't able or willing or however they put it to really engage life so if you talk to some of the people like my age and us so i'm 66 so you talk to people my age and up what 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 you'll find is that they grew up with the church at the center of their lives and community it just was you spent time there i mean we used to say well we kind of lived at church as well as at home you know, and we weren't on staff. I mean, we were <laughs> just, we were kids, you know, we would, and, and so we're very embedded. Um, today, all of you get this little slice of people's time and attention. It's a little slice. When I was growing up, the church got all of you. And so did the family, you know, so that's, that's a lot of change in a very short amount of time. I would say in the last 25 to 30 years, that's a lot of change. But think about it. How much time and attention do you get from your most active people in a given week or year? It's just a little, little bit. It wasn't so long ago, two generations ago, that you had a big chunk of people's time, attention, loyalty, energy. It's just different. We're never going to go back to that world. That world existed for all kinds of reasons that are cultural, historical, and the rest. But it's different, and it's challenging. And yet we have the, um, 
from the first bunch of slides, uh, the statistic about the, the duns who are still um, a good majority, a, a third to two thirds of them still actively engaged in faith. Yes. So while the institution and the thing that you join and embed yourself in might not be getting as much attention, um, the people are still connecting with God, which is our primary purpose for existing in the first place. Um, and I think that um, while we may, may not see them in our pews on Sunday morning, um, it, it sounds as though, um, as though that is a population, not so much that, that needs us to draw them in to be part of us, but a population that we can learn from as to how they engage their faith in daily lives and in, in those, um, in those network ways where it's just kind of, it is just another thing that they pay attention to amongst all these other things they pay attention to, as opposed to something that is cordoned off to Sunday morning. I love the shift, Andrew, that you just talked about of how do we find out what's going on in their lives and how religion and spirituality is, is at work in their life. And then maybe ask the question, how can we support and encourage people, even if we do not see them on Sunday? You know, yeah. um, that metric, we'll talk a lot about this. The metric has to change. The metric can't be how many people did I get to Sunday worship? I think it's going to have to be blended with how many people am I in relationship with, connected to, resourcing, supporting, equipping, nurturing. I think the metric's going to change. You know, um, if you're, I hope you're following the chat box. You can put the chat box up on, on a column. Um, uh, Amanda, just th that's a great line. She said, I was going over our VBS numbers today about a third show, no church affiliation. And which is one of the reasons why we should do VBS really, really well and then stay with people for the 11 months before B until VBS comes back again. You know, so I always will talk about that in the second half of the course, but you've got all kinds of opportunities. You build a relationship with these people for five days, and then the only thing we're glad of is that by Friday afternoon we can collapse because VBS is over. And I, my point is Friday afternoon is the beginning of a relationship with people. So VBS was kind of you were courting or you were, you know, you were dating, and now go the next step in that relationship and build a real meaningful relationship with them. So, yeah, good, good, good stuff. Other people. Um, our preschool, we have a preschool here, and I'm unmuting, so you may hear kids in the background because I'm back it's there with good. them, um, it's, which is all good, joyful noise for me when I work. Um, none of those parents, of the hundred and some parents that come to the preschool, have laptops or personal computers at home anymore. It's all done on their phone, and we've done a really great job with the preschool in embracing that and connecting with them that way. We haven't done that well with the church in that, and and that um, we're still with that generation that is more paper directory, paper newsletter, that sort of thing. To the person who does only just have a cell phone, you have a vast majority, and so it's a little harder to connect, I think, with the technology. Yeah, it can be. It can be. It can be difficult to connect. Um, uh, it can be difficult to connect, um, but what's so interesting is um, one of the things I suggest you do: do a what I'll call a um, um, technology audit. Um, excuse me for a minute. Absolutely. I just have to turn down the speaker. There we go. Um, do a technology audit across the generations and find out what people actually have. Mm -hmm. uh, or what they have access to. And we'll talk more about that in the second half of the course when we talk Wonderful. about networks and internet and that kind of stuff. Um, but that would, be, that would be really fascinating because sometimes people say we don't have things and all of a sudden you do a little technology audit and find out, oh my goodness, we have all this, you know, people have access, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's the older adults who go to the library every day. What are they going to? 
They're not going to read the newspaper. They're going to go access or the person who's got a Kindle now, you know, because the kids, the, the biggest technology splurge is coming. It's called Christmas, you know, and watch what people are going to get, you know, and because, you know, my 96 year old mother-in-law, She's got her, she got my iPad on it as Kindle and, and Audible, and she's good to go. It's remarkable. We took everything else off the screen, by the way. She could only press two things, book or Audible, because we don't want to mess around, because she gets she places on the iPad that Apple never intended, you know? So I think she will test it with 96-year-olds from now on, not, you know, kids. Um, but she's, she, she does a book or two a week. Right. I mean, like at 96, yeah. she can barely hear and she can barely see. Yes. Stop her. It makes the, I mean, there's only four words on a screen, but she's able to do it really well. Absolutely. Let's stretch for 10. I have uh, on the East Coast, 37 minutes after the hour. Uh, we'll be back at 47 minutes after the hour and we'll dig into an introduction to the ecosystem. Okay. Uh, just mute yourself and uh, just leave everything on screen, no problem. Um... in the recording and um, I'm hoping everybody sees that okay yes yes great thank you okay great and uh, feel free to put things in the chat box. I've got that open, so make sure you've got the chat box open as well. Um, and then, be, by all means, save some questions for our last part. Okay. Well, it decided to go back. So this is the review of the first part.
Okay. So I'm calling this an ecosystem, and you don't have to use that word, but what I'm trying to get at is that we need to a, a much more comprehensive way to form faith in the 21st century that starts with the reality of the 21st century. Okay, so for most churches, um, they've inherited faith formation from the 19th and 20th century. So a lot of our models like Sunday school or youth group or the rest are simply inherited from another century. So I try to pose the question, what would it be like if you thought about faith formation in the 21st century? And what would we need to do? So there's something old and there's something new kind of built into this. It's just important to put a perspective on this. So when we're talking about Christian faith formation, the notion of lifelong journey is really essential. Um, a couple of years back, the Episcopal Church in the U.S. Uh, did a charter for lifelong Christian faith formation. And they just used this very simple but yet challenging understanding. They said, Christian faith formation is a lifelong journey with Christ, in Christ, and to Christ. Lifelong Christian faith formation is lifelong growth in the knowledge, service, and love of God as followers of Christ as informed by scripture, tradition, and reason. I've kind of put it into this sentence and saying that faith formation is a lifelong journey of discipleship, kind of the, our task to foster discipleship, but for a lifetime, which is a process of experiencing, learning, and practicing the Christian faith as we seek to follow Jesus and his way in today's world. So it just, it helps us kind of see that we're talking about a really holistic faith. Um, Tom Groom has, in, in, in really all of his writing over the last 30, 40 years, has always talked about this more holistic notion of faith as head and heart and hands, informing, forming, and transforming. And I, I like these two understandings, these two slides, because it just helps us focus on why are we doing what we're doing and how we want to touch the entire person in faith formation. And then out of all the research, I've been using these eight faith-forming processes as, 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 a, as a way to kind of say that these are the kind of the prized things, the cherished things, the evidence-based things that really promote faith growth over the whole lifespan. And so none of this will be unfamiliar to you, but it's the convergence of all of these that I think is really the essential piece. So when you start to say, well, we do one or two of these, it seems to me it's the convergence of all of these that we do as church, as faith formation, uh, that really will make a difference in people's lives at church, at home, as individuals, as groups, as families. Um, so none of those are unfamiliar to you, but it's the convergence of all of those that I think really make a significant difference. So this is what I would describe as the new ecosystem. Uh, I've been looking for kind of a diagram that kind of gets at it. This is getting closer. The four big components or arenas in which faith formation uh, needs to flourish is intergenerational, at church, in the faith community, through our life and our ministries and our relationships, at home, whatever that family is like, both kindred and non-kindred, uh, it happens at home. Um, in which faith is lived, expressed, experienced. People are, in the first two decades of life, are immersed into this Christian way of life. It happens across the life cycle. So at each stage of life, children, youth, young adults, midlife adults, mature adults, older adults, at each stage, we're trying to be responsive to the unique needs of that life stage. And it's missional. And faith formation means going where people are. Um, being able to do a faith formation that both is outreach, relationship building, expands the notion of our church beyond the walls of the campus out into the community and people's daily lives, and provides a pathway for people to relationship with Christ and discipleship. So I, I think these four interrelate and interact in a life-giving, faith-forming system. What's new about the 21st century is it's digitally enabled, enabled and digitally connected. So one of the spheres is not digital. The digital is the enabler and the connector across these. Um, and, and so in a 21st century way, the digital and the rest 
Uh, if you go back 500 years, um, the, the revolution of the printing press was an enabler and also a connector in many ways uh, for literacy, the democratization of learning, new forms of schooling, the, the, the advent of literature and novels and the rest, and the wide distribution of knowledge. Um, the digital, the printing press was an enabler in the same way that the digital tools, media, and the rest are enablers and connectors. So um, I try not to talk about digital faith formation per se, but digitally enabled and digitally connected faith formation. Um, because at the heart, intergenerational family, life cycle, lifespan, and missional, that's the faith forming power of the new faith forming ecosystem. But it's, it works, it's accelerated, it's, it, it's communicated, it's connected digitally. Uh, and I think that's what's new. The game changer for me um, is the integration of these four and the connection uh, and, and the digital uh, revolution that enables and connects it. And hopefully you'll see me play that out in the next uh, hour. So intergenerational, for me, uh, I've spent you know, three decades working with intergenerational faith formation and really trying to reconnect the generations. We're going to a whole course on this, but to move a church from what I would call implicitly intergenerational to explicitly so. So in a sense, every church is intergenerational by default. But how do we really become intentional about our intergenerationality in church life and in faith formation? Uh, connecting the generations, engaging everyone in the life, events of church life and the Christian faith. Um, this is just playing to our strengths. Um, Holly Allen, you're going to read her book, uh, Intergenerational Christian Formation, has this wonderful quote that really connects, you know, if you will, uh, you know, four, four millennia of tradition uh, that throughout scripture, Hebrew scriptures, uh, Christian scriptures, throughout scripture, there's a pervasive sense that all generations were typically present when faith communities gathered for worship, for celebration, for feasting, for praise, for encouragement, for reading of scripture in, in times of danger and for support and service to experience authentic Christian community and reap the unique blessings of intergenerationality. The generations must be together regularly and often infants to octogenarians. And I just think that one paragraph kind of gives you the sense of why we need to play to our strengths across the generations and be very intentional about our intergenerationality. Churches, synagogues, mosques are one of the, are one of the few places in our country in which multiple generations gather to do intentional things with each other. Uh, it's very, very rare. So we're going to talk about how to connect the generations intentionally, how to infuse intergenerationality, experiences and relationships, into our existing ministries and programs which are often age-focused or age-segregated, and then how to create new intergenerational experiences, whether it's caring relationships, whether it's celebrating worship, rituals, milestones, learning, and prayer, and in service and mission. And there's just places to be intergenerational are, are just are everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, worship and learning and prayer and social events and mission trips, retreats, mentoring, leadership. Uh, it's weaving this intergenerationality through everything we do because we know that in intergenerational relationships, faith is transmitted, faith is formed, faith is supported, faith is nurtured for everybody, not just the young, but for the whole community. Family faith formation. The, the heart here is that we recognize and take seriously the fact that parents and the family are the most powerful influence for virtually every child and youth outcome, personal, academic, social and spiritual religious and that parents are the most important influence now parents might be grandparents uh might be other significant adults in the family uh, but that parent role is the most significant influence on the social and religious lives of children youth and even emerging adults christian smith affirmed that truth in his studies given the central of families and shaping the lives of children and youth the value of engaging supporting and educating families 
should be self-evident to all of us. Oh, if that were only true. Um, but our practice is really contradicts this slide because oftentimes we age segregate and remove the family and the parents from a central role in faith formation. So we're gonna explore how families are at the center of faith formation, not the periphery, but the center. To see the home as the essential and foundational environment for faith nurture, for faith practice, and the healthy development of young people. And that building faith formation around the lives of, of today's families and parents rather than have the congregation prescribe the programs and activities that families will participate in. This is a central shift. If we put families at the center, we'll take our cues from ministry and faith formation from them, from research about them, as opposed from things we want to prescribe for them. And that diagram tries to get at that. At the center is family and parents, and that church life and ministries and the wider community are there to engage, support, equip, and resource families. Boy, if we made that one shift in church life, so many things would change in our communities. We're going to explore and look more deeply at eight core strategies. They're not the only eight, but the core strategies for nurturing faith at home, for faith in the daily life of families, for families in the context of their community. Um, so we'll look at how to help them discover God in everyday life, how to form faith that it, with young children, older children, young adolescents, older adolescents, milestones, the seasons of the church year, uh, through God in the Bible, through the congregation, the community, how to connect them in a generation with all the other generations, and then develop a strong family life and empower parents and grandparents to be faith formers of their children and grandchildren. Lifelong faith formation is going to look different. Number one is we're going to get beyond children and parents and youth and parents. Those are two important stages of life, but they're not the only stages. So that age group and generational faith formation addresses the unique life tasks, needs, interests, and spiritual journeys of people at each stage of life. So not only do we address individuals in the context of the intergenerational and individuals in the context of their family, but we address individuals in the context of their individual life stage. Uh, and so faith formation has this life stage focus to it. Um, again, a central piece of lifespan faith formation is put the learner at the center. We have so much prescribed curriculum. We buy curriculum from publishers that prescribe the journey. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about how we create networks of learning, faith formation, resource acti activities, experiences, people, and we fashion that around the learner but we place the learner at the center, not the curriculum, not the resource, not the program. So we want to offer a variety of content. Well, I'm sorry, I want to move to this slide and we'll come back to that, but we we'll offer a variety of content. We want to offer content experience that are responsive. We want to offer multiple environments. More about that in a, in a second. And we want faith formation that really is very 21st century-ish, if you will, immersive, multimedia, multisensory, visual, participatory, experiential. We now are surrounded by an abundance of religious content in audio, video, digital formats. Um, faith formation and learning has become on demand. It's mobile. It's 24-7. Um, pretty remarkable stuff. And our curriculum is going to be formed around these eight central faith forming processes. So as I'm working with churches around curriculum, I'm saying curriculum, the new curriculum are these eight faith forming processes. It's, it's not just a content, it's an experience, it's relationships. Um, and so as we, as we work through the life cycle course, we'll look on the left column how we take these eight forming faith forming processes plus people's life stage issues and develop faith formation around that. So even curriculum is gonna shift in this new ecosystem. And then lastly, missional. Uh, missional has two dimensions for me. It has the outreach piece, connection, relationship, building, engagement. Out, expand the campus. Move the church campus out into the world. The whole world is the church. Uh, and then provide pathways for people as a result of our outreach, our relationship building, people may inquire 
provide pathways people to consider or reconsider the Christian faith. Um, I've always liked uh, the title of one of Marcus's Borg's book, book, and the book was uh, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. I think a lot of people have probably met the Christian faith or met the church or met Jesus uh, earlier in their life, and they really need an experience of meeting Jesus again for the first time. And there's all kinds of marvelous experiments. And when you get to the missional course, you may start considering those. Uh, St. Lydia's is in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and it's a dinner church. It started in Manhattan and they've kind of moved over. Uh, it's a dinner church that uses their space as a co-working space for the neighborhood during the day. And then church and programming and Sunday worship in the same space. Um, so it's, uh, they say it's a church where life is lived out around the table. Um, pretty impressive place, St. Lydia's. And this is, uh, you, you'll meet uh, Keith Anderson, if not in person in a course, but all, in his book as well, uh, his book, The Digital Cathedral. But he does a God on tap in his community in Pennsylvania. And that's an actual picture of God on tap. And they, yes, they are in a bar with God on tap. And so it's physical but it's also virtual. So his God on Tap blog prepares people for what they'll be discussing that night. And then they actually sit down and this is the fun part, have a beer and talk about faith and life. This is a marvelous project. We'll look at this more in depth uh, in the missional course, but you can always check it out. It's just simply called the Slate Project. And they do a great job of blending the new technology. So they talk about a new kind of Christian community, both online and face-to-face. So they do a great job of using social media for faith formation, for using Twitter for faith formation, as well as gathering together to discuss Bible study, worship. So it's this wonderful blend of online and face-to-face -face that's kind of seamless. Uh, check out their website. It's a great missional outreach to people. Um, it's just amazing. And this is, I always love this example. This is one of the first fresh expressions from the, from the United Kingdom, uh, outgrowth of the work of the Archbishop of Canterbury's instigation, so to speak, to create new expressions, fresh expressions of church. This was an old Methodist church, you see up in the left-hand corner, that was you know, down to, oh, I guess, 10 or 11 people. And they decided before they went out of business, they would at least take a shot at repurposing the church to be more than just Sunday worship. And what they created was the Wesley Playhouse. And this is a family life center, an early childhood center, a preschool center um, that serves thousands of people. It's right in the middle of town. It's an old church, so it's right in the center of town. So it's perfectly positioned. And the inside of the worship space in the church became these the spaces that you see with jungle gyms and all that kind of great stuff. Um, but they are just a huge presence in their community serving children, youth, families, parents. Um, and they still do Sunday worship, and their Sunday worship numbers have even grown a little bit. Um, pretty remarkable stuff. And lastly, um, uh, this you may be familiar with Unbinding the Gospel, but another missional outreach that also is a pathway. Um, I was with the Lutheran Church a couple of years back, and they were getting ready to implement Unbinding the Gospel. They had identified 100 people in the congregation that they, they're ready to engage in a 40-day preparation program for them, which was study, prayer, worship, small groups. And their task at the end of the 40 days was to invite one person to a four-week taste and see church experience. Um, and it just, it's, a, it's marvelously scripted out that uh, provides this, you know, uh, re-entry, uh, a pathway uh, guided by a church member to another church member. So it's been um, really pretty impressive. Digital enabled and digitally connected. This is what drives so much of this. So it's how we can extend uh, our church-based programs out into people's daily lives, how we can reach families, how we could be more missional, uh, how we could do learning with children and teens and adults that that is more engaging, more interactive, that expands the campus into people's daily lives. Uh, the digital media allow us to do all that. So uh, we'll use this continuum uh, literally in every course, um, but it, it just goes from red on the right, the gathered program with supportive content, which is simply me doing a program where I'm showing using digital content, 
video, audio, that kind of stuff in, in, in an established gathered program. To green, which is really a, a, a gold mine of possibilities. And that any program today can be extended with online components. Sunday worship can go from one hour a week to seven days a week. Um, what we're learning in a, in a Bible study can be extended in what we do online. So it's online um, components, a digital platform where content and experiences can be put that extend and deepen the little bit of time we have with people in a gathered setting. The middle is the blended of online faith formation and gathered. A great example is flipped classrooms. A number of people are experimenting, we'll talk about this in the second half of the course, with flipping the classroom for things like confirmation because kids are so busy. Can, they, can we have them access high quality content uh, uh, on their own and in small groups and then gather uh, in a more episodic, let's say monthly fashion to, to discuss and process and to uh, demonstrate what they've learned. Um, so flip classroom, many public schools are doing flip classroom, um, many educational institutions, uh, universities and the rest. The last two are, are primarily, uh, if not fully online. So like mostly online with regular interaction is like taking an online course like we're doing where a lot of it is on your own, but then we gather like this for regular interaction and presentation. And then the abundance of fully online uh, faith formation, the content experiences. So in many ways, our, the, the, our designing of faith formation can now work with this richer palette, uh, bigger canvas we can paint on of all these possibilities that may make any gathered program that we're doing right now take on a huge, can have a huge impact on people and allows us to design brand new programming uh, that reaches people where they are because people already have the gizmos and gadgets. But they don't have something to put in the pipeline that are faith formation content and experiences. That's the ecosystem. Let me stop for a moment and see how you're doing. That's the big picture. How do we create a new way of doing faith formation that's comprehensive and multifaceted where all these things work in sync with each other and use all this digital tools and media to help make it happen. Thoughts, questions, oh my gods, and any of the above. We are struggling with intergenerational. Um, it seems that how most people define it around here is the parents, the children, and maybe an older adult or two. Um, single adults, young adults, they don't see it applies to them. Older adults who don't want to do something that might be too youthful, it doesn't apply to them, that sort of thing. So I was just wondering how you, how you would define it to your congregation. Well, parent-child, it is intergenerational, but I call that family. Yeah, that's family. Yeah. And I think for me, I want to add the third generation to that. So intergenerational for me is, is at least two generations. So you could have the grandparent with the grandchild generation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not family faith formation. Um, right. And so I try to distinguish the two. I, I, I don't think I'm slicing this too thinly. I think I want to separate the two. There's so many doors to intergenerational. In other words, um, but it is about all, for me, it's about all the generations in the faith community, right. how, how I connect them. Um, and sometimes it's very, it, it's intentional on your part, but very subtle on their part. Um, so it's, it's the, the ways that you take, you, you take advantage of all the opportunities that you already have where there's not explicit connections being made, where it's not intentional. So, you know, one church, all they did was look at every time they gathered to ask, how, do, how are we hospitable and how do we get the generations to simply talk to each other in every gathering we do? You know, like if you took Sunday worship and you just said, can I build in five minutes of intergenerational connection? That's simple. Right. But you did it for 52 weeks a year. So take vacation Bible school and you say, how can I bring our older generation in with children and teens? Not every day. I mean, but how can I bring them in so there's some, some intergenerational connection? 
So whether I bring the kids to the adult, older adults, the older adults to the kids. So you start looking for how to infuse it in all kinds of different ways. Okay? Because that's what I mean by saying we're implicitly or by default intergenerational, but not intentionally right. or explicitly. Right. That's the difference. And sometimes it may wake up, I mean, I've done a lot of intergenerational learning programs where I really work with churches and, and you'll see that in the intergenerational course, LEAF will take it through churches that really transform themselves because of the way they do intergenerational learning and faith formation. Um, but that may not, that's not necessarily the first place to start. That's a big transformation. But we have all these opportunities. They just kind of slide by all year long, you know, that are social, that are, that are, that are worship, that are learning, that are ritual. Um, if we just started there and did a whole year of just being intentional, things would start to happen. And then, and then people would say, you know, intergenerational is about bringing all of us together. Hallelujah. You know, they get it. But I think they have to experience it. And it sounds funny to say that, but I think people live, generations live so fragmented that when we bring them together, they're, they're bad at it. They, they don't know how to talk to each other, even though it's the most simplest. Of they do know how to talk to each other, but they're not confident that they can. You know, So you need an excuse, an activity, a program, a, a worship piece, a prayer, something where they can do that. The other thing that always works is putting people on the stage. And I don't mean literally on the stage, but a contributive piece where a younger generation is contributing something to all the generations in the church or the older generations doing storytelling with the whole church. Those kinds of contributed kind of participatory things, they always work. They absolutely always work. Because people, people want to hear from each other. Um, my, my wife and I were, were music band parents for what felt like 100 years. And all of you, because there's so many parents here, all of you have been to an elementary school music concert. And you look around, and it's very intergenerational. And one thing you know, nobody's coming for the music. They're coming for the kids on the stage. So it's contributive, and everybody is having an intergenerational experience. It's that simple. Now, if you do more of that as part of our regular routine, when you say, well, let's, we're going to do intergenerational learning or intergenerational festival, it makes sense. It's an outgrowth of that. So that's what, Holly Allen uses the word intergenerationality. Kind of sounds awkward, but that's what she means. Intergenerational culture. I think it's, well, at the, as that declined in our churches, so did religious transmission. So did support for families. And I think we already do a lot of that. It's just when we label it as intergenerational, you get the pushback and you don't get the buy-in from uh, you know, the church. But when you don't, it's there. So, so you call it intergenerational with your team and planning, and then just right. like we're going to have right. ritual, right. Ritual, exactly. play, we're going to eat fish on, you know, whatever. You know, it just right. as long as you're intentional – and they're having a great experience. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's, I don't need to call it anything. Just call it church. Because that's what church is. They'll get that. Yeah. But it is, it, is that, it is that seize the opportunities that are there and then add some new things. So it's connect, right. infuse, and then decide what do we want to create that we don't already do. Mm -hmm. I like it three... I like three or four generations gathering, not just moms and dads with their kids. For me, that's, I plan family faith formation for that. Right. And parents have to show up because their kids are there. I mean, like, it, you know, like you got to bring your kids until third graders drive, parents are coming. Um, mm -hmm. So, and we don't want third graders driving, so we want the parents. Other thoughts about the ecosystem and the comprehensiveness. You have two years to work that out. This was just the welcome to faith formation in the 21st century. You're okay? All right. Um, I walked in on a group of people the other day after worship. There, was, there were two gray hairs about three or four young adults because we have college students 
and a whole bunch of 10, 12 year olds. And they were around one phone doing the Pokemon thing. <laughs> so we can utilize the rest of the culture too. Sure, sure. There's an, I, I've watched a number of churches do what they call App Sunday. And it's, uh, it happens after Christmas because Christmas is the great technology you know, giveaway called Christmas presents. Um, and a couple of weeks later, and it's the middle school and high school kids serving as the technology gurus for the old gray hairs. Now, you don't have to be old to have gray hair, but you got the general drift. And it's, and it's after worship and across from tables. And it's like the Apple Genius Bar, but with your own geniuses. You know, and, and that's, it is one of the best intergenerational experiences. People will be talking about it forever because the best thing is the, the people who need to learn the technology, this, you know, the 50 and 60 and over crowd, now leave with a real live person that they can call or text or email for help. Well, it's not about learning how to use the app. I mean, it's part of it. It's about building relationships. And those relationships are conduits for faith. So all of a sudden, all these app gurus now have relationships with three, four, five adults in the community who know them by name. Priceless. Priceless. Merton Strauman discovered that five or more thing back in 1974 in Five Cries of Youth. And every research study, whether it was Search Institute or the Fuller Youth Institute, keep coming up with be a five to one church, five adults to one kid. This is just an easy way to do it without ever saying five to one or saying intergenerational, you know, like just do it and, but, and be that and have some fun. Okay, let's look at the last piece, network, and then think about questions you have about this whole, whole big piece. Um, and don't be overwhelmed at, or too overwhelmed or something like that. All right, I'm going to share the screen again. I trust that you see this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. So if the first concept, if the first concept is the ecosystem, the second one is network. So the two big concepts are this comprehensive faith forming system. And the second one is a network approach. Now, here's what we know so far. In the 21st century, we need to do we need faith formation that's responsive to 10 decades of life, five generations. If you feel overwhelmed by this, you should. I feel overwhelmed by even saying it. But it, it just it gives you a sense of this is what's at stake. 10 decades, five generations, diverse spiritual religious identities, diverse family forms and styles. This change in digital culture and its impact. If you, if you want to know why you feel so tired, this is why. And the decline in religious transmission. So we have to be responsive to that. We need a faith formation that's going to be comprehensive. So we can address that, but we have to address it comprehensively. So, and the, and the key is you, you can't do enough programs to do this. You can't do enough activities. You're going to run out of nights and days and facilities and energy, and you're going to go to a therapist. Don't, don't go to a therapist. Um, so we need this comprehensive faith formation, but the question is, how do you do it in the 21st century? So what do we need? We need a variety of content. As people's needs are more diverse, we have to respond with a variety. We need new methods, immersive, multimedia, participatory. We need new formats. I don't know if you're noticing, because I think people are voting with their bodies or by attendance is that faith formation and ministry is becoming more episodic than linear and sequential. It's, it's like if you go to recruit somebody to be a fourth grade Sunday school teacher and you say 30 weeks, the look they're giving you is this is a lifetime commitment. Um, so people are thinking of episodic. I'll give you a couple hours here. I'll give you three weeks here. I'll give you maybe a day here. But they're thinking about really – episodes or event-centered kind of faith formation where 
I, I, I do a number of things. They add up to a variety of involvements, but they tend to be episodic as opposed to linear and sequential. We're talking a lot more about micro learning, especially in digital formats, five, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, some of us might remember when a YouTube video went, God, 10 or 12 minutes, and we thought, boy, that's really short. Now it's three to five. And if you do a Vine video, it's what, six or eight seconds. I mean, like, really? On demand. Um, in other words, it, it has to be just in time. So if I have time, can I do faith formation? If I have to drop everything to schedule it and come to where you are on a specific time, you know right off the bat that participation is going to go down and go down dramatically. It's now mobile. Personal participatory can go anywhere. And it can be available 24-7 on a digital platform. We're gonna, it has to be designed with new digital media and digital platforms that allow us to blend physical settings and virtual settings. And we need to have multiple environments, self-directed, mentored at home and small groups, large groups, church-wide, that's the intergenerational piece, in the community and out in the world. So all of a sudden, we've just broadened our campus again. Um, So if you were starting from scratch and you knew that people had the technology for learning, that people are connected with each other and are reachable, that people have time in their busy lives to connect, participate, interact in online experiences and communities, how many times a day do people check their Facebook status, you know, or Facebook updates and posts, texts, all that kind of stuff. They do connect as part of the daily flow of life. That people are already engaged in learning online. They're already doing it as part of their job, work, application, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatever. They're watching, uh, uh, you know, coaching videos because they're coaching soccer, baseball, basketball, fill in the blank. Uh, people are already engaged with others online in spiritual experiences. I'm amazed at the, um, the variety of prayer devotional apps and the rest and the, mon the traction that they get from people. It's remarkable. And that people now have access to an abundance of content in all types of media formats. Podcasts. I mean, podcasts are huge again because they're so portable. Um, it's now available 24-7. And really, the vast majority of the stuff is all free. So if you knew all of this, how would you do faith formation? That, for me, is, is the big question. So I'm going to suggest this. We would start to do faith formation as a network. This is a real website. Uh, families, it's, it's one of the three websites I, I've created as example kind of websites. So here's a network for families. Now, the, the menu items across there, it's just, it meant, it's just meant as an illustration, not a real church, but the menu items across there are big, big content areas that reflect uh, the eight faith forming processes we looked at and the reality of family life. And that those are put together in what people are calling playlists. Now we're all familiar with playlists, iTunes, Spotify, people, but we're curating now playlists of content experiences around the lives of families. So this platform is available 24 seven that people can access it. Um, and some of it is gathered programs at church, but a lot of it, is we come to you programming, whether it's like a webinar for parents, whether it's monthly events or experiences, whether it's a monthly activity, whether it's in support of Sunday worship, it, the blend of you come to us, we go to you, that kind of two-way street is really, really important. So on a digital platform, we can integrate our response to all the diversity in families and to those eight faith-forming processes and their stage of life. And so we form, we curate playlists. So one of the big shifts over the next two years will be to move from what I call creators of all the content activities and programming and the designers to become curators of experiences and content and relationships and programming and activities. So think about curating and creating on a continuum and what's going to happen is we're going to be much more curators who, off, who sometimes create as opposed to now primarily creators who sometimes curate. That will be the shift.
And so here you have playlist of content. We'll talk about how to design a network in four month seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And that will curate great content and will create some programming and content that we can't find. And so this is organized around eight big areas, milestones, seasons, Bible and Sunday worship, um, intergenerational events at church, family life, parents, God in daily life, and faith at home. Well, I got these eight categories. These are simply the eight strategies I outlined before in terms of families at the center. Um, we can do the same thing with adults. In fact, this is perfect for adults. A digital platform that has lots of digital experiences, small communities and the rest, and some gathered programming at church. Same concept, build a network, you'll be doing this and you'll do this really well. And then playlists, adult living, discovering faith, enriching faith, scripture, seasons of the year, service and mission, spiritual life, Sunday worship. Um, this, this kind of content is now available to us. Create some, curate a lot. Um, it, and it's available 24 seven. It looks, it's mobile responsive. All the new websites are mobile responsive. Looks good on a phone, looks good on a tablet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looks good on a computer, obviously. But it's, it's faith formation that's both on the go, connect with you, as well as at church. And it's that blended model. Remember that from the continuum. Some, some is gathered content. It's extended online. Some is online content. <clears throat> and we could even build a whole community network. <clears throat> Excuse me. A whole community network. This was actually a prototype I did for a church I was working with that wanted to build out a website for their whole community. And every month they're taking a Christian practice or virtue and they're, they're building Sunday worship. It's not a lectionary based church. They'll do a sermon series on that. And so Sunday worship is the whole church experience, intergenerational, and then it will extend out into adult, young adult, teens, and just off the edges, families with children. And they'll, each of them will have content appropriate in September this month to gratitude, next month generosity, service, peace. They're doing this for the next uh, 16 months uh, of programming. Um, and they're calling it a life worth living, a community-wide, year-long faith formation experience. So there's all kinds of ways to build networks uh, this one's built around the primacy of Sunday worship and intergenerational experiences, and then out to live that as adults, young adults, teens, and famous with children. This one's built around adults in, in, you know, basically in all their diversity um, with a variety of diver, diverse activities and playlists for them. And this one's built around families and the realities of family life. And again, with a diverse set of experiences that they would have um, at home, in the car, at the ball field, at church. So when we're talking about faith forming networks, um, we're really talking about building out these kinds of experiences for people um, that just gives us a broader platform to do faith formation. Ecosystem combined with network, digitally enabled, digitally connected. Um, that's what you got yourself in the midst of. So I hope you're ready for the journey. It's a great journey. Um, when you see some of the things, I, I'm going to post, and I'll put together of the next week or so, a list of all the things that the first two cohorts have done just as a product of this course. It, it, pretty amazing stuff when, when you grab the idea that build out an ecosystem, use the digital tools and the network to make that happen. It's, it's pretty exciting. Thoughts, questions, time to take a breath. You kind of gotten the big overview of everything. What are you thinking? It's safe to think here. 
In a half hour, you gotta go back to work, but it's safe to think here. Hi, hopefully I won't lose you this time. Are you yeah. there? I'm here. Okay, yeah, I lost you before. Um, I think it's very exciting. I really like how we're looking at nurturing relationships through a different venue. Um, and also from, um, I think what some have called the attractional model to the missional model, you know, going out um, and remembering what, what we're called to do. Um, but I think there are a lot of creative ideas, just the things you've shown so far. You know, I've been jotting down. I was like, oh, confirmation. I have to come up with confirmation stuff. What about if I did have them do something, you know? So my mind is starting to go with that. So, uh, and I'm pretty lucky because I have some people here who I think are excited about doing some new things. So I, you know, I'm looking forward to learning. Yeah. It, it, you know, I'm glad you said that. Pamela. It's just, it, it is about relationships. Um, people get sometimes they hung up on the digital side and I say, Oh, don't get hung up there. It's about relationships and it's about doing faith formation. And the best part about the digital revolution is this, even if I don't know how to do it, I've got a community of people. I've got Facebook experts. I got Twitter experts. I got probably website builder experts right in my community who have never been asked to share their gifts and talents. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uncover some folks, um, or I'm going to cover some people who know people who know people, and I and I got what I you know what I'm you know people who could help me do this. So I'm not so much concerned that you know how to do all the technical stuff. I just want to bring our faith formation expertise to the table to say how do we do faith formation if we have all this available to us? I think it's, for me it's exciting. Um, I often look at this all this uh, all the tools and media and the free stuff and said you know when I started 46 years ago in this. I filled a half a shelf with every youth ministry resource I could find in 1969. You know, there just was nothing. And if I had a tenth of what's available today in 69, oh, what we could have done, you know, it would have just been unbelievable, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but now it's 2016 and it could still be unbelievable. So what are you thinking? I think you kind of touched on something else that, um, will be important is that you're going to be sharing, you know, what the other cohorts have done. Yep. You just talked about, gosh, if I had all this information that's out there now, back when, um, and I think that sometimes we forget that there are others out there that can help us that either have paved the way or are working alongside the same area that we are in. And um, it's going to be important for us to um, work together um, <laughs> One, one of my friends says, glean and adapt. Uh, the other says, steal for Jesus. Um, <laughs> and and um, the technical name for that is curating. <laughs> it sounds much better. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, and I just, you know, I've been very lucky in, in my setting that I have really wonderful colleagues around that I can, I can ask, well, what are you doing about this? And, and what can we do together to, to help this out? And um, I'm looking forward to, you know, working with everyone here um, on, on sharing, you know, what we have too, so. I'm hoping that over the two years, as the other two groups have done, is that as you share things, um, whether real time or off time, people sh can comment on each other's thoughts as well as work and share with each other. Because I think that sharing was already happening in the chat uh, box of think about this resource, if you tried this, we tried that. You want to do that. That's what this is meant for, you know, and, and we'll keep building it into each of the programs. You'll see I'll do a bunch of churches next time that have already gone down this road three, four, five years ago. And so you've got a chance that they've been at it for a while. And so what are they doing? How are they thinking about this? What are they learning about? The nice thing about being cohort three is there was a cohort one and two. The nice thing about being 2016 is that, you know, there's churches that started back in 2010, 2011, trying some new stuff. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay, one more thing. <laughs> um, I really loved how, um, uh, was it this, the seasonal 
um, topics you had, it wasn't the topics so much, you know, the content, it was the visuals. The visuals were so beautiful. And sometimes we forget about the artistic piece. Mm -hmm. And Huge. it's, and I think we are a very visual people. Yep. And if we could build on that, and I keep finding in the congregations that I'm involved in that there are a lot of artists who are not tapped at all. But I think they could do a lot with adding their faith, you know, their art to their faith and sharing it with the community. Just a thought. Oh, it's a good thought. It, it, <laughs> I guess the best way to say it, remember when we were a text-based society? You know, no text anymore. It's all visual. You know, mm -hmm. so we need to capture those the artists, you know, they've always been there. Okay. Um, I want to introduce Nancy Going. Um, I'll give you a sense of what you're going to be involved in in the next uh, weeks of self-paced learning. You're going to go kind of step by step through each of the elements of the ecosystem. Um, this video will be online. You can go back to it anytime you want. Show it to your team. Um, during the course, if you've got questions about content of the rest, you just pop me an email, whether out of course sites or just to jroberto at lifelongfaith.com. You've got my email address because I've sent out a couple of emails to everybody. Um, we'll, we will bug you politely to say, it's been a couple of weeks now. You should be at this point. You know, you should be a couple. Of, so just to remind you um, that you know you're going to be learning. Um, the if you have questions about the content or questions, just by all means get that to me. Um, Lee said he would put the video up tonight, so you'll have that accessible to you. Um, a little bit about the learning guide, and I'll ask Nancy to introduce herself. Is that um, Norma, Norma and Norma's people uh, will be will be a learning group. And then our role of a learning guide, um, when we set up the online program, one of the things we want to do was that besides the teacher, you have another one, another person on our team um, who you can, you can access as you work through um, content, as you, as you apply it to your congregation, as you work with your team. Um, so it's not quite a coach in that sense, but it is somebody that will check in with you in each course, see how you're doing, somebody you have access to. So there's at least two of us that you have access to throughout the course. Um, just feel free to use that. And that'll be true in each of the courses. So it'll be the instructor and the learning guide. So um, our goal is to support you and encourage you. So um, ask for the help you need. That's why you're in this program. Um, in a sense, we want to kind of wrap our arms around you and say, here's a structure for the next two years to really do some transformative stuff and enjoy, have some fun doing it at the same time take advantage of us. So Nancy, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Nancy Going, and as John mentioned, I'm the uh, Executive Director of Vibrant Faith, and um, so Leaf has had this role before with the other two cohorts of being the cohort guide, and, and I get to uh, jump in here now with all of you, and I'm excited to be able to do that. And our idea with this, as John said, was to, um, to make sure that you get that we want to walk alongside you in this process. So there are going to be content questions, certainly, and those of be the ones you would uh, throw at John. But then there's also going to be all kinds of, um, gosh, why aren't they jumping on the bandwagon with this questions? You know, what, what is it about my situation, about my ministry that, uh, that is making this a hard fit? And, um, and we just want to be there for you. And, um, but we want that to be very intentional. So I'm going to be emailing you in the next week or two to set up a time for us to have a phone call and uh, for me to just be able to get to know you. Our idea with this is that I, as your guide, would walk with you through the entire two years so that, um, so that you've got somebody uh, who's accompanying you through this whole process. And um, yeah, and so I'm looking forward to this being the beginning of that relationship. So you'll have a variety of teachers coming and going through the courses, um, but the cohort guide will be the person who is, who is uh, yeah, the person who's accompanying you through the process. So I just wanted to pop on here today. I'll be on these sessions every time so that I make sure that, um, that I'm right there with you with, uh, with what you're learning as well. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. So it's a treat to get to be here with you. Great, thanks Nancy. You're welcome. Any other course questions before we bring our first live presentation to a close?
Well, great. Welcome. Actually, I have one. If I have a um, technical question, sure. Um, just more that I was trying to get my password back, and I plugged it in. Are, are you there? Yes, I hear. Oh, I thought you went away for a second. Sorry. No, you're not there. Uh, <laughs> I just need to get. I just need to change my password so my group. I could, you know, because I don't remember it, and my computer automatically puts it in. Um, the and I tried thing, to do that, and it didn't work. Um, send a note to Leaf, and he can go in the, you know, he can mess around with course sites to get into that. Okay. All right. well, Leaf is the one among us who really knows the, the ins and outs of course sites, and he's the one who's loading the course stuff up there and stuff like that. And probably okay. what he'll do is just send you another invitation. Yeah. Okay. Longer. Um, the other thing is, um, even though it is a lousy email address, the no replies at course sites, which for so many people ends up in your junk or spam folder, uh, just watch stuff from there because that's where uh, I'll send it from my email, J. Roberto at Lifelong Faith. Nancy will correspond with N. Going at Vibrant Faith. So you'll get that as a regular email. But sometimes you'll get something from no, um, no reply at course sites. Yeah, you can't reply, but also you probably can't get it sometimes either. So um, just keep your eyes out for that uh, as well. And if you adjust your spam folder to accept that, that's of course site's going to generate that automatically sometimes. So, but uh, Pamela, he'll, he'll be able to help you kind of get that settled that's in. Right now. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, folks, congratulations. Thanks for being part of, of, of Vibrant Faith University, course number one. Um, We'll see you in a month, um, a little over a month, beginning of November, um, for live presentation two. Um, all the sessions are online and live between now and live presentation two. We won't load the live presentation two live sessions until after that, so you'll have plenty to do between now and then. Um, if you have questions, just send me an email, but thanks so much for taking the afternoon to be here. Um, it's it's going to be fun. So. Um, I think you'll have a great time with us. So thanks. Thank um, and God bless. Thank have you. a great month before, before we see you again. Be well. Bye.